Okay, this is a random rundown of an MP CNC. This is the Primo model and all of the pieces that go into making it here. <coughs> MP CNC stands for Mostly Printed Computer Numerical Control and you can see some of the parts of this are 3D printed. Uh, the red and the green parts and the white parts here are all 3D printed, and the orange parts too. I was using various different colors of filaments for various things. So what you have is a simple conduit to make up the, uh, uh, the rolling structures, and some printed parts to hold it all together, stepper motors, belt drive system along here, over the motors. <clears throat> then you have the central core of it, which in my case right now has a spindle motor attached, but you can actually put all sorts of things in there. You can put a laser, you can put a drag knife, or you can put a an extruder. So this can be a 3D printer, it can be a laser engraver, it can be a vinyl cutter, you can put a pen in there, it can be a plotter. And in my case, I'm using it as a CNC milling machine. And you can actually see in there right now, I have a small bit attached right there with a, an alligator clip on. That's actually something I'll get into later, which is for the zero homing position. <clears throat> various different bits that I use, so there's different size um, 90 degree end mills and then I also have some engraving bits here. These are typically used for printed circuit boards or engraving different things. So, it's basically an XYZ uh, motion frame and then there's the controlling electronics here. So what I'm using here is a Ramps 1.6 board with a full graphic LCD to display information. There's a 12 volt power supply that powers the stepper motors, and there's a variable speed uh, power supply that powers the spindle. Okay, so let's look at some of the operations here. This is the full graphic LCD module for it. And this is the default uh, display in the firmware that you download, which is the Marlin firmware for the uh, um, ramps board. So I'm just using the default firmware, although I did make a couple of changes just to get my name in there and you can see we can then control the motion of it and we can move an axis and you can choose which axis you want to move and how far you want to move it and specify a number and then the axis moves which you can hear it actually moving over here and do another move and there it moves and back it goes so let's position it somewhere away from the home what I call the home position so I'm going to go and I'm going to move the x-axis as well and I'm going to move it 10 millimeters and I'm going to move it out a little ways too so that's just using the display and the control. Now the other thing you can do is you can home. You can home a particular axis or auto home does all three axes. And I'm going to press the auto home and we'll see what's going on here when it auto homes. Now you can see it moves the Z axis up a little bit moves the X and Y axis to the end stops 
and then it brings the z-axis down and this is where that metal plate on the bottom and the electrical clip comes in handy. It actually brings the tool down till it actually touches the metal plate. Comes down fast so it touches, backs up a little bit and then goes down to the zero position. So that's how you can zero, set zero where your uh, unit is just by touching that. And that's done with the end stop connections on the ramps board which are all of these. So I've got the first two connections here are for the X motors, the next two are for the Y motors, and the final two are for the Z connection. And you'll actually notice I had to reverse mine because my Z one is actually switched around because as it turns out my spindle is already grounded and if I had it the other way around I've got the yellow and the uh, uh, green wire on my clips here. So I just have wire soldered onto the green wire soldered onto the plate and the yellow wire onto the clip. Well, it turns out that the polarity, because it's already grounded, it thought it was already at zero all the time when I had them reversed. So I'm going to have to switch these two wires around. First, I want to go over a few of the things that actually gave me issues. Um, things like, simple things like the display. So there's the display and the way it hooks up to the uh, ramps board. There's actually a special, like the display is very standard for 3D printers. It's got an EXP1 and an EXP2 connector. Um, but there aren't those connections on the ramps board. And so they use an adapter daughter board that plugs onto the top of it that connects to uh, at least three connectors on the board there. So you need one of those adapter boards with your display. Hopefully your display came with that. The other thing I wanted to talk to talk about a little bit is the firmware in the uh, it's a Mega 2560 that the ramps board plugs onto, which is an Arduino board. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about the motor driver chips, which are these guys on top. I have another ramps board I've been experimenting with. This is a ramps 1.4 board. The one that you saw over there was a ramps 1.6 board. Functionality is the same. Um, this one happens to be hooked up to a, a standard character-based LCD instead of a full graphic. That requires a firmware change. There's a In the config.h file, there's a couple of lines that you have to change to disable the full graphic display. Um, I'm using what they call the RepRap discount displays. And the full graphic is the RepRap rep discount full graphic display. And that is enabled in the firmware. The, the dual end stop firmware that you download from the V1 uh, engineering site. Um, so I had to disable that and enable the RepRap discount display non-graphic. Um, so, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about was these driver uh, modules. These actually drive the stepper motors for your uh, CNC. And I have two different types here. There's the uh, 4498, which is the A4498 type, which is an older style, and a newer style, which is an 8825. One of the first things is uh, that you need to know before you hook up your motors and everything is there's these little trim pots on the, uh, the boards that actually have to be set before you can use uh, your motors correctly. And the little trim pot is, that's a trim pot there, there's a trim pot there. On the 8825, the trim pot's on the upper end. And so what you end up having to do is you actually have to measure the voltage, um, what they call the wiper of the trim pot, and that determines the current that is going to go to your drive motor. So you make sure that you set that voltage before you actually... Uh, plug in motors and uh, apply the 12 volt uh, power for the motors. Um, now the other thing that's real key on these is the 
important thing on the orientation is an enable pin. So the pin that's at the top left here, you can see on the 8825 board underneath it actually says EN on the little silk screen and on the A4498 there's the EN with the top left corner there. If you plug them in backwards you're going to fry chips so make sure you plug them in correctly. So they will plug in onto your RepRap board into these spots for them, into these headers. But before you do that there are a set of jumpers that have to be installed underneath um, to set what they call the number of steps. And to make your life easy, the steppers that the dual end stop firmware available from the VNC, VN, V1 engineering uh, website is pre-configured for the 8825 driver chips and you would install all three jumpers on the headers um, underneath the driver chips. Okay? Um, if you want to use the older 4498 then you would have to do a firmware change and re reinstall the firmware onto the uh, uh, Mega 2560 board in order to um, take into account the fact that the 4498 and the 8825 use different stepping. Uh, you can see I have two of these uh, 4498s here and the right hand one is how you're going to actually use it. It has the little heat sink glued onto the uh, the board. I used a, uh, a heat sink paste to actually glue it on. Uh, some of the heat sinks come with a double sided thermal tape that you can use to stick them on but you're going to make sure you have those on because the stepper motors draw a fair amount of current and those little guys get hot. I'm going to back up a little bit. I keep talking about firmware for dual end stops. What it has to do with is figuring out where the home position is and I actually have end stop switches. You can see the little micro switch mounted right here that's wired back to the controller and I have the same switch over on the other side. This one's easier to see over here. So I have on the, on the same axis I have dual end stops and I have both motors plugged into separate channels on the board and Therefore, they are driven independently by the controller board, and when they drive to the end, because there is some amount of flex that you can have um, if, you, if you look at things, the, the whole thing, if one side drives faster than the other, it can flex, and that can change the squaring of objects. With the dual end stops, it means when it starts up and you home it, it comes until these switches hit a little, I can show here, they hit a little stop that you put on. And you can hear them click. And that tells it where the zero position is. And that way, with dual end stops, it automatically squares up the unit every time it homes. So, how do you get the firmware on your your uh, Mega 2560 board? Well, there's a thing called an Arduino IDE that you launch, and then within there, you can load up, you can download. I've got the dual end stop version downloaded, and then there are files like configuration.h and configuration underscore adv.h that you can simply modify to change any parameters you might need for either the um, stepper drivers, the 8825 or the 4498s, um, and the uh, LCD displays that you might be using. So I have specifically downloaded the dual end stop version of the firmware from the V1 Engineering site uh, to use with my dual end stop configuration of my MP CNC. Once you've loaded the Marlin firmware into the Arduino IDE, you have to go into the Tools menu and you have to choo choose the board as a Mega 2560 processor at Mega 2560 and choose the COM port that your board has 
shown up as in Windows. And you can figure that out looking at the COM ports and device manager and plug and unplug the USB port and you'll see a COM port show up and disappear as you plug and unplug and that'll tell you which port it is. Mine happens to be plugged into COM port 11. There's an alternative way of loading the firmware onto your uh, Mega 2560 board and that's using the Visual Studio Code uh, program. To use Visual Studio Code you need to install a thing called Platform I.O. into there and there's another one on the Marlin site which is a Marlin one-touch build module which makes it really easy to um, actually build the project and upload it to your uh, Mega 2560. Um, I have found that the Visual Studio Code compiles the Arduino code about 10 times faster so it's kind of nice but it's also a bit of a struggle getting used to using it so it's not that easy not that intuitive uh, to figure out how all the pieces go together I've got the firmware flashed actually you can see I pulled out one of the 8825 drivers here so you can see I have the three jumpers installed underneath Here's the 8825 reinstalled. You can see I've got the heat sinks on them, and you can see the little trim pot here for adjusting the um, the drive current is up closest to the power connector end. For the 8825, it will be at the opposite end if you're using the 4498s. A little bit of hookup. <coughs> One X motor is hooked up to the X driver position. The Y motor, whoops was hooked up to the Y motor position. There we go. And the Z goes to the Z. The other X motor goes to the E0 connector on the board. And the other Y motor goes to the E1 connector on the board. And then, as I mentioned, there's a whole series of end stop points here to connect the limit switches. So, the first one, the X min is goes to the same end stop that's on the same side as the um, X0 or the uh, X driver then the X max goes to the same side as the um, X1 uh, the second uh, X driver same with Y min goes to Y Y max goes to the Y2 and then the Z for zeroing the spindle. And the remaining thing that I'm working on is controlling the spindle speed automatically from the board and I'm just figuring that out at this point. Um, cable chain, I actually used my 3D printer. Somebody actually has some really good designs for some cable chain out there and they're very nice convenient ones that let you pop them open to take wires in and out and they actually work really well I thought they were huge at the time when I was printing them they really keep the cables neat and when you get to some of your um, cables like this one here which actually has uh, the 2x motors and the spindle and uh, motor and the uh, z-axis motor wires coming through it you really need all the different uh, um, width for the cable tray. Um, they had a they had sort of an interesting approach to holding the top of the cable tray in. They just have this slide into one of the top tubes there which is pretty good but I had to modify it um, to get it a little farther out because I they had some complicated well it wasn't really complicated it was simple but it required it plugged into the end of the tubes or clamped onto the end of the tubes so you had to make the tubes longer which I hadn't done um, so I would have had to replace two tubes if I was going to use their approach and their clamps. Um, so I instead reprinted uh, these. I took the uh, standard uh, V1 engineering uh, clamp and just extended it to put a piece of aluminum, that's actually some door trim, um, on the bottom of it just to support the, uh, the cable chain underneath. And that worked really well. Just did one of those at each end to support the cable chain. So the next step in the process is actually sending code to the controller. First you need to generate what's called G-code that the uh, 
uh, controller understands. And V1 Engineering recommends ESTL Cam, which is actually a pretty nice, simple little program for generating CNC code. It really is a good starting point. You can use things like Fusion 360 in the CAM option if you want and do an end-to-end -end right in the one program. So this actually lets you open a graphic file and I'm going to choose a simple little one here which is a part of an acro laser drag plate. Brings it in it says what are your dimensions and I'm choosing millimeters. And so there is my plate. Let's see if it's focused enough to see. Uh, yeah, you can barely make out the circles on there. It's just a 3D plate. And then the tools for generating your what they call tool paths. So this obviously has some things here that are holes. So I use the hole tool here and I select a hole and when I click on it it makes a toolpath that is inside so it takes into account the width of your tool which is specified up in your list of tools and you can just make those up based on the width of the tools that you have available the mills that you have available so using a 1.5 millimeter mill it figures out where it needs to position itself so that that hole will end up being 1.5 millimeters. And so, for example, if I choose this big hole here, again, you can see the hole is the green area and the red is where the tool is going to go. So it's going to go on the inside of the hole. But then the outside of the plate, you don't want to make it any smaller, so you don't want to be milling on the inside of that. So that uses the part tool instead of the hole tool. And that, when you choose that, will put the, the milling on the outside of the part so that the part remains the size that it's supposed to be. Now, when you're doing these things, the other thing that you need to remember is when you're cutting through for parts, like this is, these are parts that are going to be cut out of a plate, when you're cutting through on a part, um, eventually, for example, this circle, the center of the circle, will be loose and free when you finally get to the bottom of the material. There's a way around that, and that's called uh, holding tabs. So you can select it, and then down at the bottom right here, there are holding tabs that you can put in. And all you do is posi position a few holding tabs, and you can see as I position these holding tabs, you then have, it, it will actually raise up the spindle so that it doesn't cut that part away and it leaves it there just to hold that center disc in place. And you'll want to do the same thing by selecting the outside to make sure the whole part doesn't come free once it cuts the outside. So I'm going to choose holding tabs again and I'm going to put a, put a holding tab on the four sides just to hold it in place and it auto automatically snaps to the midpoint for you. So now I have these holding tabs which are areas that will not be milled out to keep the part in place. Once you have all of the areas selected that you want to mill you just go up and use file, save CNC program and it'll ask for a name, it'll suggest the, uh, the name that you're already using save it. Yes, it already exists, so I'm replacing it. Now, I'm using the free version of ESTL Cam, which actually is a pretty unique way. If you want to buy it, there's no timing, but if you want to continue to use it free, it makes you wait longer and longer each time you save something. So I can save it. Now, it says, how deep do you want these cuts to be? I could have specified each cut individually as I did them, or I can just specify how deep I want it to go. Now I'm using 3 millimeter MDF board to cut this out of, so 4 millimeters deep will be a millimeter through into my waste plate on the bottom, which is fine. So I'm going to do that. You can, in this program, then use these tools up here to play the simulation, and it'll show you 
what the tool is going to do. So you can actually see the tool is going to move around and show you where it would cut to actually route it out. And you can see it's going multiple times because I've specified you can only cut uh, a tenth of a millimeter deep with each pass. And so in order to do four millimeters it has to do 40 passes. While ESTL Cam can control a, uh, a milling machine directly, uh, it doesn't control the MPCNC directly. It's not one of the models that it supports. So you have to use another tool called uh, Repetier Host, which actually lets you connect to the printer. So I am going to connect to the printer and then I'm going to load in that acro plates file that I did and then it will show up and you can see in the workspace area what I'm actually going to mill. So I only selected the outside and two of the circles to do and you can see it's got blue lines for what's going to be milled. You can see some, you can actually see the little red spots where it's going to skip for the holding tabs and you can see the purple areas where it's, those are just moves without actually doing any milling. And then you can actually click the print and it would start sending this to your printer. I need to make sure my spindle is on and homed correctly before I do that. Okay, you might be able to hear it now. I've got my spindle turned on and I'm going to send it to print. And you can actually see it says it's going to take an estimated 39 minutes and you can see the X and Y position moving. <laughs> 
is the little samples that I just did. You can see, and you can actually see the little holding tabs on there. You can see it when it was actually printing that. And there was me moving to the park position, and it did not raise up the z-axis when it did that, which I had set the z-axis, the park position, at 50, and I expected it to actually go up before it moved over to the park position. Oops. This is actually a video of uh, what that whole plate looks like when it's done. And you can see the holding tabs hold the outside perimeter in. And you can see I actually had my depth cut too far on the holding tabs on the circle there. I told it not to do holding tabs for the full thickness, whereas these ones up here were for the full thickness. And so this one actually came out, but fortunately it did not get involved in the cutting tool and cause grief. I didn't do holding tabs for the small holes. I just let them come out and fly out once they've been cut free. And just an FYI, on the uh, on most of the LCDs, there is also a reset or a stop button here. So when you actually press that stop button, you'll see on here, it actually halts things right away in case things are running amok, going pear-shaped, and grinding away at your bed or snapping tools. You hit the halt button. And then you hit it again, and it resets and gets itself back into a ready state. There's a few things I still have to do. I have to uh, figure out how to uh, get the power supply, or spindle power supply controlled from the actual ramps controller. And I know that there's a couple of issues there. The uh, typically the ramps controllers output a spindle speed control using a um, variable pulse width output, I think, and this requires a 0 to 10 volts DC input to control the speed. So I will need to build a pulse width to uh, DC converter to control the spindle speed so that it's automatic and turns the spindle on when it needs to be on. I have to uh, correct my uh, one z-axis uh, probe wire there, reverse that, uh, get things in the case, um, and I also have to figure out how to eliminate the offset distance. My, uh, my z-axis uh, zeroing plate is 1.5 millimeters thick and after I zero out that leaves it 1.5 millimeters off the workspace. I think I either need to add some g-code at the beginning to move it down 1.5 millimeters and reset that as the zero um, or figure out how to add a z-probe offset in and I'm not sure whether that gets done in the um, uh, ESTL cam or in the Repetier host, so I'm still working on that.